Is this sound good with the mic? Yeah, sounds perfect. Hey guys, Crippen Governor from the Gut Health Gurus podcast. I've got a background in food science, and today we have an absolute superstar in the world of the microbiome. I'm guessing maybe people who are just starting in the microbiome journey might not be familiar with Dr. Amin, but we're going to get into it. Dr. Amin Zogani, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm very delighted uh, from this uh, nice introduction, and definitely my pleasure to be on your show, so thank you. My absolute pleasure, Dr. Amin. And what I like to do at the start of the show is to get it straight from the horse's mouth. Who is Dr. Amin Zogani? I, uh, it's, uh, it's been a journey, to be honest, uh, to arrive where I am today, or at least the, the, the chair I'm sitting. Uh, I have a very, uh, let's say, uh, an orthodox career or path of growth. Uh, how did I come to arrive to the microbiome? It's a long journey, but I can cut it short. Um, I am an engineer by training. I've, uh, I'm born in Algeria. It's in the north of Africa, for those who doesn't know. Um, I've done my engineering degree there, uh, more from a microbiology and biotech perspective, really trying to kind of understand how to build bioreactors for production of microbes, for instance. One of the first microbes I worked on uh, was from the, the desert of uh, the Sahara in Africa, like literally those microbes that can resist to high salt concentrations and my goal was there to understand how these microbes can actually live in, in places like that, right? So, and I tried to understand from a, a molecular perspective, the proteins that these bacteria produce, maybe they have a specific formation or conformation, as we say. There was a lot more from a bioinformatic perspective. Unfortunately, in Algeria, there was not that much of interest into bioinformatics or wearable kind of technologies. So I had to move uh, around the world, and I landed in France, where I did a PhD in microbiology. And this time, instead of actually loving microbes, I was rather hating microbes, <laughs> to say. I was trying to find uh, solutions how to kind of uh, find new antibiotics against specific microbes that can uh, actually affect the health of neonates. And that was literally the whole objective of my PhD. And I think the first months or so, my PhD supervisor uh, came to me and he said, uh, listen, this is the future of health of medicine. And he came with a book. And that book basically was about probiotics and prebiotics. Back then, it was like in 2013. I had no idea what, what these stuff. I mean, I've heard of probiotics, but like I never worked on them. But I told him, listen, this is not my, my subject of research. He said, listen, take this and you will thank me after. A few days later, I worked in the microbiome and I worked in different startups from small to a little bit big that was acquired. And that was the, my journey on the microbiome and probably we can go uh, on it later. But yeah, my journey is a little bit different uh, than, uh, so I switched from actually someone trying to kill microbes to someone to trying to preserve microbes. <laughs> and yeah, that's what I'm doing today is literally trying to save microbes as much as I can because I believe uh, they are the essence of our existence uh, on all sorts of forms. And uh, they are the ones who are basically keeping us healthy, not only us, but also the anything around us. And I think we should do our best to keep some of the microbes good, at least. Eh? So, What an amazing journey and almost that, that step, that step inward into discovering the microbiome, working on projects perhaps to, to kill off microbes, uh, helophiles, I think what you were referring to, but then discovering that microbes are actually also beneficial for humanity. So I'd like to dig a little bit deep, deeper, Aiming. How about your passion? Where, where did you develop this passion for the microbiome? Because when I look at your LinkedIn posts, I highly encourage people to follow you on LinkedIn and watch what you post because I very closely follow you. And you have this beautiful way of summarizing very complex microbiome research and then putting together a small little articles or, or LinkedIn summaries on the gist of the post and also inserting some of your 
insights into that. So where did this passion come from? Because clearly I can see you're posting so much about it. So you're spending so much time in the microbiome. So there must be something that you love about it. So where did this passion come from? It's a great question, and thank you for uh, for your um, encouragement as well. And I definitely follow your post, and I also hardly encourage people to also follow yours as well. Huh? Um, honestly, I, I think um, if you're a microbiologist and you have at least discovered what the microbiome is, I, I actually can't understand how people can uh, turn away from that, honestly. Because the minute you dig in, you say, okay, it's impossible that someone can say, okay, I, I'm not interested anymore. Because th there is so much to learn. And although the first uh, human microbiome project was launched in 2007, uh, we still don't know that much, right? So, I mean, what do we know? Like maybe one, two, five percent? I mean, we uh, have worked on the microbiome for so many years, let, let, let us say decades, and we only have three approved microbiome based therapies that only came to the market just last year. So meaning that we have so much still to be done. And, and even those therapies aren't that complex. We are talking about some stool from healthy people being given to uh, some people who have uh, CDI or Clostridium difficile infections. So it's not that complex. Literally taking stool from healthy donors and giving them, this is was practiced for centuries, like in from the yellow soup in whatever, like centuries in like probably 120 years ago. So it's not that complex. The technology we're already using and approving. So meaning that what we are still need to be done to get something, how to say, technologically developed, like, I don't know, engineered microbes or single microbes that can literally target specific diseases or cancer cells and what so. We're still a long way to go, meaning me and others still have to work so hard to find something novel or something at least meaningful that can save people's life. And I'm looking for that little idea somewhere in what I actually share. So when I actually share a paper or a, a post on LinkedIn, it's rather my ideas I'm sharing, actually. I'm trying to uh, send in you know, a hook to someone somewhere in the world that may, may be inspired and and I'm happy to say that few people got inspired and started some ideas because, you know, you never know. So I say, OK, if I don't share what I've learned today on my coach, usually when I do my posts is in the evening, um, I might not inspire somebody. So I rather share it and I hope to inspire at least one person with that post, which enables me to be happier. And at least I and the thing it depends is a little bit more how to say um like selfish because when i do share posts it also allows the post to engrave in my brain and i will never forget them afterwards <laughs> so it's a win-win for you to get the post and for me to engrave them in my brain so i hear you i hear you amy most people might not know is the reason why i started this podcast was also very self selfishly to learn from experts so I think the motiv the motivation is very honorable because you are trying to summarize a very complex research paper into some very simple, perhaps actionable steps for someone and then putting it out to the world. So it's almost a win for you and then a win for the world. So it's it's completely honorable and I I applaud you for, for what you do. And so the the, another little side note that I wanted to explore is, and how did you go from engineering to microbiology? Because so many of my guests come from such interesting, diverse spaces, but find themselves completely enthralled in this microbiome space. So how did you make that transition? The transition, actually, to be honest, was um, more or less planned in, in my brain. Um so as you said, like earlier uh, about the communication. So I believe that all uh, scientists, and this this is the unfortunately the things that we don't actually learn at university. And I and I I really encourage students or PhDs that really trying to get their steps through the PhD and to access industry. There are some key skills that we don't learn at the university. In my opinion, 
Three of the most important skills that uh, all PhD students should be learning today, not tomorrow. Uh, number one is project management. Uh, number two, uh, communication. And number three, today is easier than yesterday, is marketing. So uh, because when you're working in a startup or any company, either small or big, you have to manage projects uh, accurately. So you have to kind of deliver them. Uh, you have to be able to clearly communicate your ideas uh, for some people who, I mean, if, if you're speaking to CFO, a chief financial officer, I mean, th these people usually come from banking or like finance and stuff. And if they work in a startup, biotech, work in the microbiome, they very likely have no clue what microbes is or probably never seen a microbe in their lives. But if you start telling them about, I don't know, QPCR or very complicated wordings, or metagenomics, we're going to do barcoding. They say, what, what are you talking about? So you have to have a language that is adapted to these people to enable them to see the essence of your work in the lab, to enable you to get the funding necessary for you to actually do your job. Otherwise, you will not be able to do so. And then when you've created something or you created an idea, you have to be able to market that idea properly. Like there is a difference between marketing and communication because marketing is more like you're trying to sell that stuff or communication, you try to inform about it. And, and for me to do the switch between engineering and microbiome, actually, so in my PhD, I've noticed that microbiome is something that is far beyond what I, I thought. And I, I try really to work towards that goal is to get into a startup where we can actually work and harness the microbiome. So I was in this startup uh, in Ireland called Noritas. Uh, we were using artificial intelligence to try and to find peptides from plant proteins. Uh, the peptide is literally the, the small pieces of proteins, right? Uh, and these peptides, we're trying to identify them using artificial intelligence, not the, the chat GPT that we know today. This is literally was seven years ago. And basically looking into the DNA of these plants, like plants like we're talking about potato or tomato or any plants, they do have proteins in them. Find the peptides, these little pieces of proteins, that basically can have a beneficial effect. And one of my uh, departments was basically finding the beneficial effect of peptides on the gut microbiome. So when you take a plant protein hydrolysate, you, like, you, you hydrolyze those proteins with enzymes, you drink it, they land on the gut and trying to see what is the impact on that. And honestly, when I started working on that project, this is the, I've never looked behind um, because it's, it's just a fascinating world. And, as I said, we are still on probably 5% of what we actually should be knowing on the microbiome. So that was likely the switch. And since then, I was only looking for companies or startups, mostly interested in startups than companies, to be honest. Why? That is because of, there is a freedom of innovation. There is a fast pace. You can really execute, test, execute, test, and execute. Uh, so yeah, and, and, and since then, I'm still there um, for now 10 years. So. That's incredible. I mean, I completely understand where you're coming from because it's almost the microbiome is so is so undiscovered, for want of a better word. I mean, there's so much more to learn. And from that learning comes the opportunities to develop technology, therapeutics. There's still so many problems to solve in the world, especially when it comes to, to health. So I completely understand. And I'd be remiss if I didn't step backwards just a, a little bit before we move forward. You mentioned there were three areas that were being almost developed in the microbiome space. So you mentioned something around the fecal matter transplants. Now, what were the other two? Because I think people will be fascinated to hear that. Absolutely. So that is the conventional one that um, th there is huge debates. I mean, at least for the ones who aren't from the microbiome space, uh, I call them the disbelievers. Uh, so the first one is the huge debate is about the probiotics. So uh, probiotics and all the biotics that comes with, right? So, but mostly probiotics. So you have a lot of people um, from the space uh, understanding the benefits of the probiotics. And by the way, not all the probiotics are the same. Uh, not all probiotics do work. And and there is also, again, here we have the 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 issue of communication and marketing so there are a lot of probiotics being marketed as probiotics uh, for, for funny just i open uh quote unquote here um yesterday i was in the pharmacy i um, i had to get my new supply of probiotics uh 
I couldn't get it from uh, my usual supply side. Okay, whatever. I'm going to the pharmacy. So I went in and I, hello. So I asked the guy, uh, what products do you guys have? He said, um, do you want it activated or inactivated? I said, ah, interesting. What do you mean about inactivated? He said, you know, kill probiotic. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, uh, man, do you know that a killed probiotic is not a probiotic? Because a probiotic, by definition, is a live microbe. That is the definition of the ICEP, uh, this International um, Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics. Uh, so I said, I said, why do you say that? I said, listen, I work on this space. I know what a probiotic is. And if it's killed, it's not a probiotic. I mean, you can call it definitely a postbiotic, but it's definitely not a probiotic. And this is a pharmacist. He's somebody who has a degree and like, you know, a study at university and so on. Meaning that today, when you look into the marketing that is around probiotic is mostly wrong. And at least people aren't really informed in the right way. And that's why we would find um, misinformation. And some people may be benefiting from taking probiotics. They wouldn't do so simply because they see, hear a lot of noise. Uh, probiotics are not good or are just crap and what so so that's one probiotics are the easiest the cheapest probably and they're most of them uh, at least that you can find with the strain meaning uh, my name is amines organi that's my strain name uh, like i'm different than yourself because we have a complete different background different uh, coming from and so on so strain meaning you would find the name of the bacteria and behind that name, you would find a number or like letters and what so that defines the strain. These strains find the strains that are clinically tested that can definitely help you. But this is, let's say, the this is was practiced for so many years now, and they're sold on the market. And you can definitely find them in kefir or fermented foods and stuff with low amounts, but you can definitely find them there. So this is the easy one. And then we go another level of complexity. And we go more towards therapeutic application. And here we speak about live biotherapeutics, abbreviation LBPs. The LBPs are basically single strains to some extent. And we can also find consortia is basically a combination of different strains, which are attended to uh, treat, like meaning that we develop them specifically in the context of uh, clinical uh, therapeutic application, meaning that there is a clinical trials that is developed specifically for those LBPs to target specific diseases that um, we can find them in IBS, developed into uh, IBD or cancer and what so. There are a lot of companies working on that. So this is one strain or several strains together. And obviously there is no, not a single approved LPP today in the market. So because we're still in the research uh, phase. There are a few in phase clinical two, but none had made it to phase three or phase four. And then we go another level of, let's say, complexity and less complexity. Why? It's a complexity because we have a big consortium or a, a huge number of bacteria that we actually don't know how they interact together. And it's not that complex because it's just coming from the stool. So the, which we call them the fecal microbiota transplants the FMT. So there is, a, there is one strain or several strains of probiotics and there is uh, LBPs is one strain or several strains, but this is for therapeutic application. And there is another strain, which is uh, the fecal microbiota transplantation. And here we, what we try is to find healthy donors, uh, people who usually uh, aren't medicated, they eat well, they sleep well, they exercise, and we run them through a battery of tests to assess the, the, the integrity of their microbiome, uh, the, or at least this com its complexity. And we also do say that there are some super donors, these people who actually do, do have uh, super microbiomes. So we get their stool, uh, we analyze it to assess there is no pathogens, there is no viruses, or there is no COVID in the case when we are uh, in a COVID uh, period. And then we transfer them to uh, people who aren't healthy, uh, who are suffering from uh, various diseases, uh, going from Prostidium difficile infection, where we today have an approved product in the FDA and also in Australia, and uh, to uh, autism and, and many other diseases. The only one approved is Prostidium difficile infection, but none in the other uh, areas. But I hope some will come together in, in the future. 
for FMT. And there are in, in parallel to FMT, we do see other applications from human donors. And this can uh, include uh, what we call today VMT, vaginal microbiota transplantation. So we take uh, also uh, vaginal fluids from healthy women and we give them to women that suffering from uh, bacterial vaginosis or in, in very one of the best papers I've read last year is about uh, a woman that was actually having bacterial vaginosis and also have recurrent pregnancy loss. So we have transferred, uh, it was published in The Lancet, uh, transferred uh, vaginal fluid from a, a woman that was healthy to this woman. She got pregnant after five months. And it was wow. one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard in my life. So, Wow, I'm giving goosebumps because... I, I completely understand that and I, I have friends in this space who have been trying to conceive for, you know, for many, many years un unsuccessfully. So when you talk about things like this, it, it makes me a little bit emotional. So th thank you so much for, for sharing that amazing cutting edge research that's happening right now in the world of the microbiome. So we know we've had this one particular treatment that's approved for C difficile. So how how does the how did are these live therapeutic preparations administered? It depends. So uh, when when we go to the FMT, so there are um, at least two versions of it. Or I mean, originally there was one version or two versions. So basically, we could. Uh, um, uh, you know, we get the stool samples, uh, we homogenize them, obviously after analysis and so on. Uh, we kind of dilute them to be able to put them in a syringe and then uh, we put them uh, in the anus to, and then inject them into the colon, right? Mm. So this is one. And the other one was uh, during endoscopy, we also uh, inject them uh, through it there. Uh, the technology have been developed so far today that we can actually uh, freeze and dry the stools to to render them into a powder format, and then we can put them in a capsule. So it's way more convenient than actually having to have a syringe or an injection or endoscopy. So we can actually take those three or five pills a day uh, containing, so you, you don't actually see that as, as a stool. It's brown pill that you can find, like turmeric is brown. So yeah, imagine as turmeric or anything like that. So it's more like a, a brown pill that contains freeze and dried stools that you um you know swallow and and that's basically it huh? so this is that that's being said even today we still have uh, the two varieties or the three so we we still have syringe uh, injections uh, we still have uh, now few companies developing these pills and we do have endoscopy uh, where you can actually give it uh, you know through endoscopy to the colon deliver it locally amazing and i'm imagining if people are interested in these these particular therapeutics to speak to the medical professionals here. I'm based in Australia, so certainly wherever you are in the world, there's going to be different reg regulatory pathways, but majority of my audience tends to be in the US or Australia or Europe. So I'm imagining these legislative frameworks are kind of working closely in, in unison. So do you speak to your medical practitioners, gastroenterologists, if you want to explore these treatment options. Now, now Dr. Amy, I'm, I'm fascinated because you're one of these experts that are at the cutting edge. So we mentioned a few, a few different pathways that the microbiome research is heading towards. Is there anything else that's exciting in terms of the advancements in microbiome research that's really piquing your interest right now? Absolutely. I think, so, so there are, honestly, there are many, many things that excite me in the microbiome. Probably everything excites me in the microbiome, I would say, because everything is, is fairly new. Um, so one of the things that I uh, they're developing in parallel today is uh, having to develop these kind of therapeutics for a variety of applications and diseases. And I'm extremely happy to see that today we're considering more and more women's health and infant's health um, for the reasons I we've mentioned earlier. I mean, women are the one conceiving and, and uh, bringing uh, happiness to this world. And I think they definitely deserve more attention and i really try to push this as much as i can even in my post linkedin i try to push as much as possible when i find research relevant to that 
on women's health because I think it was a little bit neglected. And, you know, when, when we speak about women's health and we try to see why investors will actually put money and companies and startups that do work on women's health, you'll be surprised to know that uh, they just say that we don't have that much of return on investment, which is insane. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's not like everything is on return on investment. So today there are companies who have been financed in, in the microbiome space in women's health or rather companies that are working on fertility because there's a lot of money, obviously. So they will get their money back. But when we speak about bacterial vaginosis or candidiasis or, you know, these recurrent infections that women have, and I, I got a lot of messages from women asking me what what probiotic I should be taking or what treatment I should say. I said, I'm, I'm not a doctor, like a medical doctor, a scientist rather. Um, it's insane to see that we don't have that much of investment in there. So thanks God, we, we have some companies today stepping in and they try, managed to find money to kind of create products in that space. So, and I hope my message will reach any investors to put more money in women's health. Infant's health is also another thing because we know that the microbiome, or at least how it's shaped, is in the first five years maximum of infancy, which will even shape how I do uh, think today, or probably my immunity, how it reacts and so on. So it's very important that we seed the right microbiomes, not the right, but the, the, the correct one that enables us to stay healthy when we grow. So I think understanding how we should shape what we should be doing for infants, it's crucial. And I'm also happy to see more companies into that space. The other thing that I think, uh, again, is, is being taken from a, a, a wrong side, in my opinion, is microbiome testing. So we have uh, a, a lot of, you know, companies actually uh, selling uh, gut microbiome testing or, you know, and name it. So many microbiome tests in the market. I think some of them are good, honestly, but not all of them, because there is also... So if you would like to test someone's microbiome, you have to be able to uh, see what you can offer afterwards. Like I've already, okay, I've take your stool or take a swab from your skin to test your skin microbiome or your gut microbiome or whatever. What what else? What what can I do with those data afterwards? And I think it's more of a race of, um, against data than uh, than anything else. So I'm happy to see that. Uh, now there are some, uh, let's say, government initiatives, uh, or at least uh, from institutions that are trying to use the microbiome testing to rather advance the microbiome research, not for commercial purposes. And that's a good thing because it en enables us to, again, see beyond what we are already seeing here. And I think, in my opinion, what will change the, um, the history of the microbiome in the coming uh, years, in my opinion, it's not what the bacteria that are in there, but rather uh, what products they're producing or what uh, metabolites they're producing. And I think the first company who managed or the first person who manages to understand why the bacteria are where they are and why they're producing, and more importantly, what they're connecting to, like what human pathways they are illuminating or triggering, I think that would be a game changer because I think we don't yet clearly understand why specific bacterium is there and why is there now. And that's the big question. Like, I, I, you know, sometimes I even, I can't sleep because I just, why we didn't find that bacteria there and why is it now there? So, you know, that keeps me uh, thinking a lot. And I see a lot of companies, few actually trying to, get it from what we call it the metabolomics this is this the molecule that the bacteria produce and that's the science of that so yeah i think that's excites me a lot and i hope to see more on that work then in the coming years completely agree i really think that the microbiota signatures are highly individualized like a almost like a, a fingerprint but as you mentioned earlier they're they're consortiums or or quorums of bacteria that are doing something beneficial in the body, and that's the that's the the where the research is exploring what are these metabolites producing, how do they react with the body, how do they react to disease pathologies, 
So I'm in complete agreement. I've had these same thoughts for years now, but I'm really excited to see where, where it's headed. And one particular area of research that's a little bit controversial, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because there's really mixed opinions when it comes to it. But what's your thoughts on synthetic biology in the microbiome space? Oh, yeah, that's a, it's definitely an area of controversy. Um, so let, let's clarify the controversy and what it comes from. The controversy comes from the fact that if we take a microbe that is naturally existing, I mean, like nature created it that way, and we as humans go and do some genetic engineering, meaning that we can insert some genes that produces antibodies and deliver them to specific sites on the body, uh, like cancer microenvironment and what so. Uh, we think that if we do that engineering, we will be introducing a GMO, like a genetically modified organism, into the body, and we might lose track or we might lose control uh, to that microorganism and what it does, right? So I think that is the fear for many people who probably don't really understand how genetic engineering works uh, and uh, how stable these genetic engineering uh, actually so I did my PhD, uh, I've engineered microbes for literally three years uh, during my whole PhD. Uh, not engineering them for the sake of actually putting them in humans, but trying engineer them because that's how we study microbes. So if you would like to study a microbe uh, or a function of a microbe, let's say a microbe is you know degrading uh, iron. Like you put a microbe with an iron, it degrades the iron. Uh, if you would like to understand how the microbe degrades the iron, you would try to identify the gene that codes the proteins for the degradation of iron, you remove those genes with genetic engineering, like you do a metagenesis, and see whether the microbe loses its ability to degrade iron or not. And that's what we call a genetic engineering. And you can do it in the other way. You put more genes into the microbe and see what it can do, uh, can do in the future. And I think the controversy today is basically, if we do engineer microbes and we release them in nature, we will be introducing something that it doesn't exist in nature and we might lose control of it. Uh, yeah, but I, honestly, after done in, uh, I have been doing engineering myself and that's some of my background. If you do engineering and you do it in the right way, meaning that you insert something in the genome of a bacterium that is stable for generations, there is no way a bacterium can actually... Uh, reverse engineer what you've done unless you give them the tool to do so so and that's something sometimes we don't actually know whether the bacterium do have the tool or not so this is where people are scared of it they say okay yeah you tell me unless you give them the tool to do so but how do you know that the bacteria doesn't have that tool maybe it does have the tool you just didn't discover it and once the bacterium is in the right conditions like the human body okay whatever guys i'm gonna do whatever i want so uh, the bacterium starts reverse engineering what you've done and then start inserting genes in the dna of the human body and what so is it impossible the answer is no do we know how to stop it the answer is no however genetic engineering today is possibly uh, one of the most fascinating tools that have been invented in i mean it, it even received um uh, a Nobel Prize just last year, right? So this uh, from Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudna on the invention of the CRISPR-Cas9, which is the human uh, DNA scissors that we call them, right? Which was also gotten from or invented from a bacterium in the first place. <laughs> Let's say uh, I'm not decided yet whether I am uh, voting yes or no against it because I'm still waiting for, I think if we've managed to find the right tools to be able to, uh, turn the plug off and on, on demand. I think that is probably, uh, the risk is mitigated. And this is what the, the, the law and the regulators are asking is, can you give us how you mitigate the risks of this kind of um, genetic engineers? Like meaning if, how can you prevent the microbe from going rogue really and getting insane into the body? And can you control it on demand, meaning you say, listen, I'm going to put the microbes in, engineer, because it's going to deliver a potent antibodies for a microenvironment in cancer that is extremely difficult to reach. I'm going to target that. However, if we see there is any signs of the microbe going rogue, we can extinguish it immediately without any question, and we can even put it into the right location and so on. 
that what we call that contagement strategies. So we're not there yet, and I'm not yet decided to be honest because I still need more data. So I mean, I'm in the same boat as you. Completely agree with what you're saying. I, I think we just need a little bit more time to explore the space before we can make some sort of informed opinion on, on the matter. But we, we have to pause for a few minutes because Zoom is going to kick us out in a sec. But what I will do is I'll send you a new link to your, what's the easiest, other email, I'm guessing. I only have like five minutes left uh, again because I still need to get the, to the iReport. Oh, uh, okay. But- yeah. Okay. So, what what we can do is maybe we can schedule a, a separate round two when you're free. Because there's so much yeah. more to talk about. I didn't think it was gonna <laughs> fly by this quickly. I've got I think I've only gotten through one question. <laughs> anyway, so we we'll, we we'll, speak a lot as well. So no, no. I, no I, I the thing is, uh, I have to get to the airport now. Um, yeah, and we, we, I'm not sure what time is it uh, at your place, but we can schedule another time in, um, yeah, following days or so. Huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. no, no rush. We we can lock it in the next couple of days, and when it, whenever you're free. And I'll then at that time, so maybe we, I could also share with you my calendar where you can uh, book the time uh, because I have uh, a Google Meet and it's a limited time. So. Ah, okay. I use. And I can record it as well. Huh? Okay, if you can record it, that's fine as well. Absolutely. All good. Let's let's speak soon again. I appreciate your time. Yeah, it's we we just oh, t- t- tip of the iceberg. So let's talk more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. See you later.